My name is Ryan. Uh, I'm part of the Gummer team. Thank you so much for coming to our first Gummer Creator Studio event uh, on building profitable alliances. We're super thankful that all you guys are here. I want to quickly go over the agenda for tonight um, and introduce our speaker who's here um, and sort of give you guys a heads up about what's going to go on. So we're going to have first a keynote from Nathan, who I'll introduce in a second, um, on building profitable alliances. And then we will have a fireside chat with Nathan and myself, uh, just talking about some of the things that he's learned, uh, and hopefully some really practical stuff that everyone will take away. Um, and then with Nathan, we'll have a Q&A. And we're going to be taking questions off of Twitter with the hashtag GumroadCS for Creator Studio. And we'll also be taking questions uh, in person here while I'm lying in the back. So as Nathan's talking, as we have the fireside chat, be thinking of questions. And we'll probably have time for about five to seven questions at the end. Um, so thank you guys again for being here. I want to introduce Nathan. So Nathan is here from uh, Boise, and he is an author of three books that he has self-published. Uh, Authority, which is a book on sort of building audiences, how to launch products, specifically in his context for books. Uh, his first book, The App Design Handbook, and then the follow to that, Designing Web Applications. All of them has, have been extremely successful, um, and over the last two years, he has done an incredible job of building an audience uh, building a community around the products that he's created and then launching products and selling products to that community. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Nathan Fair. Thanks for having me, thanks for coming, and what I want to do is just spend the next 15, 20 minutes or so and share a few stories of kind of my journey through building an audience and, and a few of the things that I've learned. So, if you don't know much about me, I run an email marketing company called ConvertKit. As Ryan said, I wrote three books. Um, first one was in September 2012, December 2012, and then uh, in May 2013. Um, the first story that I want to share with you comes from a gentleman by the name of Chris Coyer. And Chris writes a blog called CSSTricks.com. And I, I think he started it back in 2006. And at the time, I read his blog. And being a web designer, you know, I read about whatever he was talking about CSS. And I thought, I already knew that. And I kind of gave myself a little arrogant pat on the back. And then Chris wrote more articles. And I kept going, I already knew what he was writing. And I kind of had this thought of, He's not that much of an expert to be writing and teaching if I already know what he's teaching. So Chris and I kind of learned at the exact same uh, pace. We were both, I'd say, intermediate web designers. And after a while, I did start to learn something from what he was writing. And people would ask me, like, how to do something specific with CSS. And instead of writing out the detailed explanation over email, I'd say, go check out this article of Chris wrote, because it's actually really, really good. And I didn't think much about it until Chris released a Kickstarter campaign. And what he said was, I'm going to redesign my site. I want to take a little bit of time off from my work so that I can really focus on this redesign. Will you guys help fund this month off that I'm taking? And he wanted to raise $3,500. That was his goal. Uh, and what he said is, in turn for backing this, as I redesign my site, I'll create video tutorials all the way along. And he ends up raising $89,697 out of his $3,500 goal. And I looked at this and went, wait, what? So Chris and I, remember, we had the same skill level. We're both maybe now advanced web designers, I don't know. And so we, if we have the same skill at web design, how did he have the ability to basically flip the switch and raise $89,000? And I didn't. So it clearly wasn't our skill as web designers that, um, you know, that, that gave Chris that ability. So really what it was is while Chris was teaching, I was just quietly working. He was working his day job. I was working my day job. But he was sharing everything that he learned. Whereas I was just keeping it to myself and not, uh, not sharing it with anybody. So from then on, after that, I became determined to teach everything I know. And actually, I had this lesson from a few different areas. And this is the one lesson that I wish I learned much earlier. Because I also got it from 
uh, Jason Free of 37 Signals, and he talks about the idea of emulating chefs. So if you think about a chef, the ones that you've heard of, the ones you have in restaurants and the cookbooks and all that, who you spend money to see and the restaurants are booked out months in advance, those, you've heard of them because they don't take their secrets and you know, their secret recipes and all of that and keep their secret. Instead, they share it with everybody. You can buy a cookbook for $20 that has all of their best recipes. And then not only that, they, they record TV shows where they say, not only will we tell you our secrets, but you can watch you know, over my shoulder as I make them exactly. And so Jason's point was that if you want to build a following, if you want people to pay attention to your work, it's not just that you have to be good, you also have to share and teach. And people aren't going to put you out of business because of it. They're going to follow your work, they're going to buy your products, and they're going to become your fans. So the first lesson that I learned was to teach everything you know. The second one was I wanted to become a blogger. I, looked, I realized at one point that all the people I looked up to had blogs, and so I thought, okay, I should go down the road. And so I started writing, and I actually had a crazy successful post. Hit number one on Hacker News, and it was titled, How I Made $19,000 in the App Store While Learning to Code. If there's ever a great link bait title, it's that. So number one on Hacker News got 56,000 uh, visits to my blog that month, up from like 1,000 the month before. And I was pretty thrilled. I thought I made it as a blogger. I now had an audience, had all this. Um, where do you think this graph goes from here? <laughs> think it keeps going up? You know, maybe a slight dip keeps going up. Or maybe we get a great, like, really good hockey stick going. So if you were to actually hide the month of November, you would not notice that anything happened that month. Right? That it has no real impact on anything else. So basically what happened is I had all these visitors come to my site, and they all read the post, and they all left. And probably most of them never came back. And the reason is I didn't have a system to stay in touch with them. So when, I, when you see the traffic start to increase again in July 2012, it starts to climb up and it's a little more consistent, that's when I started using email. So I put up a landing page for my first book, the Apps and Handbook, and, and asked people, you know, instead of just coming, looking at this and leaving, how about you put in your email address so I can tell you more about the book and tell you about it when it launches. And that works well. You know, I started to get a couple hundred subscribers and, and build a list from there. But what I realized is kind of the power of email and being able to reach your audience. So a quick show of hands, as far as a business model, who likes recurring revenue? Does anyone think that's a good business model? So one thing that is great about recurring revenue is it's predictable, right? So if you have a SaaS application, you know, maybe you're early on, you're making $10,000 a month, chances are, unless you do something to piss off the majority of your users, you're going to make 10,000 or more next month, right? You're going, you're going to lose a few uh, customers each month, and if you can gain more than that, then your, your revenue is going to increase every month. So, I think that email is the recurring revenue of uh, the recurring revenue equivalent of being able to connect with your audience. So, these are email subscribers over uh, basically over a year, and you notice that there's a slight dip right here, but it doesn't go crazy like a, a traffic graph goes. It slowly increases. You're going, you know, every email you send, you're going to get some unsubscribers, so that content's not a good fit for them. But as long as you gain more subscribers than that in a given month, then your audience just keeps growing. So, what I learned is that you have to have a system to stay in touch with your audience. The third story that I want to share with you is from someone who I've learned a ton from. That's Chris Gillibo. Uh, he blogs at ChrisGillibo.com, his blog is called I Found Conformity. He's written a book called The Hundred Dollar Startup, and I, I've just learned so much from him. Um, we were having dinner in London uh, about a year and a half ago, just when I was starting my journey, and so I was asking him all about, you know, selling ebooks and all these questions. And at the end of the conversation, kind of as he was leaving, he made an offhand comment. He said, "By the way, multiple packages have worked well for me." 
And so I decided to look into this. If Chris says it's good, I'll check it out. So I looked at his. He had a, um, a really in-depth course called the Empire Building Kit. And he had packages at 449, 249, and I think the last one was 149. And so since my book was coming out, I did kind of my equivalent of that. And instead of just selling the book for 30 or $40, I included other packages with um, videos and code samples and, and more things, you know, templates, more things to help someone if they wanted to design iPhone applications to help them get to that goal more quickly. It's just an experiment. I want to see what it looked like. So what I learned is what would have been $9,000 of revenue in the first 48 hours ended up being $19,547. And I don't know of very many techniques where you can implement them with not that much effort and they double revenue. And this is one of them. So I continue to try it. On one of my later books, um, Authority, I did it, and I did three packages at $39.99 and $249. And I saw an interesting split. Um, this year is, um, on this side here is the sales, so the units purchased, and then over here is the revenue. And so this is the smallest package to the largest package. And you'll see that the vast majority of people purchased just the book. So 48% of people purchased the book, and then 26% purchased each of the other packages. But almost all the revenue, like 60% of the revenue, comes from 26% of the purchases. And so, when I've done this on every book. On the Amazon Handbook, doing this basically doubled revenue. On Design Web Applications and Authority, using multiple packages tripled the revenue. So, the great thing is, you can include all kinds of stuff in multiple packages. You don't have to, you know, it doesn't just have to be for business training. Let's say like a, a, a fiction author is, they're selling their book for $10, $15, but then as a higher package, they have behind the scenes interviews where, you know, they're talking about um, the process of writing the book, giving more background on some of the characters. You know, things that those true fans are really going to care about. In the business world, you know, we see this all the time with, um, with the way software is sold, you know, you do multiple packages based on how many users you have. You're not going to charge an enterprise customer the same amount as you're going to charge, you know, a freelancer. So another great thing that multiple packages do, like in my case of selling a book, is that freelance designer who wants to learn to design iPhone applications, they can buy just the $39 package because maybe they're on a budget, they want to just learn from that. But someone who has a team of designers, they're going to look at that and, and they're going to look at what's in the highest package and they're going to say, is this going to save my team three hours worth of time? You know, based on having these templates, having these other things. And they're going to have a company credit card and they're going to make that purchase of the highest package because they think about uh, spending money to save time when they can. Whereas, so, with multiple packages, you can have the low end for people who value their time more than their money. And then at the high end, you include things that save time so that the people who value their time far more than they value money can pay you more. And it will double or triple revenue. So you have to sell using multiple packages. It, it's just fantastic. A few of these stories have been Maybe they make me look good. So I want to tell you a story that does not make me look good. Um, or where I at least failed someone. I, I had made some progress. I had a decent list. I had the two books that had come out. And I decided I'm going to teach a workshop. And so I put together this whole landing page for, for it. Uh, I think the tickets were $400. And my, my basic thought was that you know, I was going to sell it to people who had already bought the design books. It'd be an easy way to teach them more, and then also to make a decent amount of more revenue. And my exact thought was, with an email list of 5,000 designers, how hard can it be to sell at 25 seats? I mean, I don't have to convert, you know, whatever percentage. It, I was thinking this was going to be really, really easy. So I put together an in-depth launch plan, and 
it was a single email. I thought it was a really good email, actually. I had like, I was teaching in the beginning and then it transitioned to if you're having these problems in your design, this is what we're gonna cover in the workshop. And I thought it was really, really good. And so I launched that and uh, I heard crickets. Out of 5,000 people, nobody bought. And what I learned is that to have a successful launch, you have to build excitement before you give people an opportunity to buy. And so, if you put a product out there and let people know, you might like this, you can buy it anytime. They'll go, great, I'll buy it someday. You have to convince them that this is going to solve the problem they're going to have, this is going to help them, uh, before you give them an opportunity to buy it. Because what you want is you want people when your product is launches, you want people to be waiting next to their computer at the time you told them it was going to launch with their credit card right there, ready to buy. Because otherwise, I think we've all done this where we hear about a product or click through a link on Hacker News product, and like, oh, this is interesting, this is cool, I think I'll buy it, it's only $40. Oh, my, cre my credit card is in my wallet, which is up in my bedroom, or you know, and so you can't buy right then, and chances are you never do buy it, because uh, we just forget. And so, you really have to have that launch sequence that builds up excitement and anticipation. The good thing is, if a launch completely fails, meaning nobody pays attention to it, nobody buys, you can, you can just launch again. So, I don't know if it's like a, if a tree falls in the forest, nobody hears. So like, if a launch happens and nobody buys, it didn't really happen. Um, so you, you can launch again, that's exactly what I did. I, I planned out an actual launch sequence. I, I took down the sales page so people couldn't buy. I don't know that anyone, I mean some people had gone to the sales page, but I just pretended that whole earlier thing never happened. Um, I had a three email launch sequence. I explained the need, um, built up anticipation, answered questions throughout those uh, couple emails that went out. And then I didn't have a great launch, but I sold out, I think, nine of the seats. And it was profitable for me um, to do the event rather than teaching an online workshop to one person or something, which would have been embarrassing. So this is another area that email is really, really great. Because you can, you can contact your customers, you can do these launch sequences, and one thing that you'll find is a good launch isn't a single email. It's, it's a whole series of emails. And so I always do sales of my book, like in the first 24 hours after a launch. I'll, I'll run a 20% off sale in order to help motivate buyers um, during that time. And one thing that I do is I send a reminder email that 24 hours in to say, hey, the launch is ending. Because there's a lot of people who, even though they've heard about the product coming out for a while, they, you know, the launch happens, they hear about it, they're like, oh, I can still buy it at any time. And so they put it off, even though they're planning to buy it. And so a launch ending helps say, okay, all right, a sale ending helps to say, now is the time to buy. So we send that reminder, you know. This is a, a revenue graph by hour for the launch of authority. Any guesses as to where in this point I sent a reminder email to the sales end? Anybody? It's kind of obvious. It was at like 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, there's this huge spike. You know, sales were dropping down, big spike, and that email drove thousands of dollars worth of sales. Maybe those sales would happen eventually. Some of them would have, but by, by keeping in touch with the customers, sending that reminder, and really sending quite a few emails over the course of the launch, um, it drove really a lot of revenue. Um, so the, the, the thing about that that I want you to take away is whether it's a little product that you're launching or something really big that, that's really important to your business, you need to use a well-planned launch sequence. So my philosophy on building a profitable audience and basically what I've learned from these stories 
is that you need to teach everything you know with a system to stay in touch with your customers while selling them multiple packages and using a well planned launch sequence. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Danny. We are going to sort of transform the stage a little bit um, and jump into the fireside chat in a few minutes. Uh, reminder, you can, if you want to tweet questions, we're going to do the fireside chat probably for 20-ish minutes, um, 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll dive into the Q&A. So if you have questions, tweet them. GumroadCS is the hashtag. Uh, and then you can also have a line in the center aisle with a mic. Uh, we can do questions in person there as well. So give us just 30 seconds to set this up. Awesome. So, Nathan uh, and I are going to hopefully just chat a little bit about some of the things that he's learned um, over the last two ish years uh, since he sort of started this whole journey. Um, and I think there's probably a lot of people here who don't know your story. Um, there's probably a lot of people here recording recently or through some of your products, but it's a pretty interesting story, um, sort of where you were, I guess like two years ago, yeah. what you were doing then, what catalyzed the change, and what's gone there. Yeah, so I'm a designer by trade. Uh, I got into web design and then gradually moved into designing software. And, um, I had a job for three years leading design at a startup in Boise, and I got to Joining that team when it was 14 people, and then it grew up to 90, and then I got to write it down the other side. Um, and so I, you know, I got to experience leading a design team. I had 14 people on my team um, working for me, basically, and that was an interesting experience. I learned a lot. But then I also started building iPhone apps on the side, and then I ended up leaving that job in October 2011. Uh, going back to freelancing, which was a pretty bold move. I mean, how old were you at this point? Uh, well, I would have been 21. Right, so um, 21 would be a good job. It's a big deal. Yeah, and the bold part about it is that my son was born um, a week before I left my job. So, uh, yeah. But, you know, I had health care coverage to the end of the year. And I didn't have seven problems. <laughs> Anyway, so I quit my job to freelance for a while, and I was constantly trying to get new products in some way. Um, I had a couple of iPhone apps that were making about $2,000 a month, and so that was a nice kind of baseline for the rest of my freelancing income, because freelancing income can be fantastic one month, and you feel like you're on top of the world, and then the next month, clients don't pay you, or something goes wrong, and you collect like $1,000, and then you feel like a total failure. And so I wanted that product you know, to even out the ups and downs of freelancing. And so I had those, um, those couple of iPhone apps, and then I had always wanted to write a book. And I actually started several and never made any progress on them. Um, and then a, a few things happened that motivated me to write that book. One was uh, all of my developer friends were asking me how do we improve the design on our iPhone apps? And I didn't really have a good, a good place to point them. Um, so I helped them out with little one-off things, but I didn't see any resources um, that I really like to say, go learn how to design iPhone apps here. Another was that two designers, Sasha Green and Jeff Drysdale, uh, both released design ebooks on the same day, and they made quite a bit of money. In the first 48 hours, they, um, uh, Sasha made $6,500, and, and Jared made $8,000. And they, they both were generous enough to write about that and share the numbers they made. And I looked at that and said, whoa, people with an audience, but not that big of an audience, can actually make money. This is really, really cool. And so I could relate to an audience of, of their size. I didn't have that, but I knew I could get to that point. Whereas I'd seen 37 Singles write about you know, they're self-publishing stuff. They self-publish Gabriel, and they're like, hey, we just passed 400,000 revenue. Oh, it's above a million now. I like, couldn't relate to having a blog of 100,000 subscribers or anything like that. So it's part of the reason why I share all my numbers is because people sharing their numbers inspired me. Um, so I finally finished that. But, oh, the, the final thing 
Go on, go on. Yeah. Um, so you talk about relating, seeing people that you can relate to. Um, if you think about this timeline of building an audience from the, the moment you decided to start blogging, building an email list, to you know where you are now with a, a relatively large email list, a lot of blog traffic, um, and, and sort of at what point in there did you decide you were going to release a product, and how far along were you? Because I think uh, what I thought and what quite a lot of people here is that you're uh, your audience was much bigger than it was when you decided you were going to write the app design handbook because the launch was successful because you're public about your numbers. Um, so how far along in that process were you when you decided that you were going to, you know, write a book and sell it? Well, I had a crazy successful blog because remember I got in that huge spike, like really successful article, and then my insanely successful blog was getting about two thousand visitors a month. Um, so not much. I had an email list of zero. And then in July 2012, I said, okay, this book is far enough along that I'm actually going to finish it. You know, I had like two thirds of the written, and I had enough confidence then that I could talk about it publicly and share it. Because before that, I was thinking, I'm not known for finishing things. Like, you know, there's a point where you're working on this in school and you're excited about it, but you don't want to tell people because you're not sure if you'll actually follow through. And so, in July 2012 was when I decided that I was going to follow through. And then I, I put up the landing page for the book, and something changed then. I had been blogging all the way along, but before that, I was a, a designer who wrote about all kinds of random topics. If you go back to the beginning of my blog, it's about anything and everything, and it's slightly embarrassing. But, uh, once I public, or put up a landing page and said, I'm writing a book about designing iPhone applications, I think there was a really big perception change in people coming to my, audience, or coming to my, my site because they said, this guy must be good. He's writing a book. And I, I had good enough design to back it up. Um, and I done you know, enough apps that, um, you know, I, it wasn't a, a baseless claim or anything. But then, I also had a sense of focus and purpose because then every all the blogging I was doing was to promote this book. So whereas before I would write on any random topic, you know, I, I had something to push towards. And so by the time I launched that design handbook, I built an email list of seven hundred and ninety-eight subscribers. Awesome. So then we'll have that launch too with seven hundred and ninety-eight subscribers. Yeah, so it did twelve thousand five hundred dollars in the first twenty-four hours. Um, and then we went on to do, I think it was 19,000, well, yeah, it was 19,000 in the first 48 hours. Um, and so I actually blew away the numbers of Sasha and Jared, who had been my inspiration. And a big part of it was because of multiple packages, right? If 12,000, half of, see, they had 48 hour numbers, so half of the 19,000, right? That would be right about neck and neck with what they did. But multiple packages, some really great pricing, double revenue, and uh, yeah, it's huge. Um, so let's talk. So you have this really interesting system for that you've used for I don't know how long to uh, sort of keep yourself accountable to write every day. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that, and then uh, want to talk about also sort of the ROI that you've seen on that time? Yeah. So. I have, have I mentioned that habit of not finishing things. Those books that I started before would get an outline, and I'd work on it and for as long as I was motivated, which was maybe about two or three pages of writing, and they wouldn't go anywhere beyond that. And so the last thing that, that motivated me and helped me actually launch this book is I read a blog post by Chris Gillibo, and he said, it's actually pretty easy to write 300,000 words in a year, you know, and he was like, that's a hundred posts on your own blog, that's 50 guest posts, that's a traditionally published book, that's two self-published guides, and he lists out all the stuff, he's like, it's not that hard. Just read through one. What? That sounds insane. How can you ever write that much content this year? And, he, you know, he further on his post, he just said, you just write a thousand words every day. It's like, a thousand words. Again, that sounds like a lot. It's like two or three pages. It's not actually that much. And so I committed to that. I knew that 
making consistent progress on my book was the only way that I was going to make, that I was actually going to finish launch the book. And so I started writing a thousand words a day. It took me a while to get the habit of lying. I get three days and this a day and um, five days and this day. But by the time I launched the after the handbook, I had like 78 days in a row uh, of writing a thousand words a day. And so I met my goal. I finished the book. And the day after launch, I was feeling really good. And then my phone popped up and said, are you going to write a thousand words today? And I was a lot of old commit that I wrote to chop all that. And I thought, no. I, I did it. You know, the book's out. It was a success. And then I looked and it said 78 days in a row. And I knew, because I could the app, that I could not check a button that said, you know, that I wrote a thousand words, that it would reset that and say zero days in a row. And I'd lose that whole streak. And so I thought, well, what can I write about next? I could write about designing web applications. So I started writing. Ninety days later, that book, the Design Web Applications book, came out. Did twenty-six thousand dollars in the first twenty-four hours, and um, I just had to look back. So how many days straight now? I think it's five hundred and sixty-five right now. As it's today. So five hundred and sixty-five days of writing a thousand words a day. Yeah. And this has been verified because we've been in conferences in Europe, and Nathan will be like, "Sorry, I gotta go to my hotel room to write a thousand words today." So he actually does it everywhere. Um, so how much, I mean, a huge percentage of your revenue, and maybe so you can live with his numbers, by the way, on the blog, so you can read sort of how every product launch does. But what percentage, uh, basically a huge percentage of your revenue is from books that you've released because of that. So what has been, what's been the revenue that you've seen from those 560 updates? So I wrote a blog post last, um, last July, and when I hit 365 days, you can find the post at nathanberry.com slash 365. And basically, I went back and tracked where all the, all the content I created went, everything that I could still find. Because I should point out that it's not a thousand words that got published in the book. Some of it was really, really bad. Um, but it just had to make some kind of progress each day. And I worked it out, and I made about 60 cents per word uh, that year. You know, if you divide out the number of words by uh, revenue. And, and so I thought that was a pretty good, good return. Um, and then for 2013, you know, for the calendar year, uh, the books and everything together did 2,000 revenue. So, and this year we're going to make that one a small number, I think. Absolutely. Um, okay, so, yeah, so I think the next, we're going to probably like two more fireside chat questions, and then we're going to go into the Q&A. So uh, either on Twitter or probably in about two minutes, I'll let you guys know when we start lining up that if anyone has questions they want to ask in person. Um, so over the last two years, you've basically self-published three books. Uh, you built a SaaS application, which is convert kids for email marketing. It's incredible. Uh, you've launched Nathan Very Live, which is sort of a podcast video series. Uh, spoken at a bunch of conferences. You're also married. You have a two-year-old kid, another child on the way. Um, Talk a little bit about how you've structured sort of uh, created balance there, especially as someone who's not going into a job that's sort of a team every day, uh, who's working at home a lot. Just, I think something a lot of people here could identify with. Talk to us a little about the balance that you created there. It, it's balancing family life and work, especially working from home, has been pretty hard for me. Um, but having a flexible schedule has been really good. I don't know that I've done particularly well at that. You know, my wife would be able to say comment on the you know, good behavior and on how well I have balance uh, work and family. But it's been really fun to be able to, like, over the summer, to be able to take my son to the park in the middle of the day. And I, I kind of got in the habit of um, getting up early. I sleep a lot less than the rest of my family does. And so, you know, I get up at 6, work for a couple hours, they get up at 8.30 and then, you know, make breakfast and hang out for an hour and a half together and then, um, and then I go back to work. The hard thing is, like, I just recorded this Photoshop course and so I spent a whole lot of time trying to get all my lessons and everything I'm going to record ready throughout the morning so that when my son goes down for a nap, I can record during that hour, hour and 15 minutes and then get the content, you know, get that done, and, 
and then once he wakes up, you know, he can't record in the house anymore. Um, so the frustrating days are when I don't get like the lesson prepared, and so he goes out for his nap, and I'm like, I don't have to record. Shoot, I wasted that entire nap. Um, anyway. That's awesome. So we're going to take uh, a question or two from Twitter. And in the meantime, if anyone has questions in person that they want to ask, clear someone, because they don't have a mic. Awesome. Jeff doesn't have a mic in the back. So if you have questions and you want to run back to the uh, center aisle, we'll take questions uh, in person here. We'll prioritize these questions over the Twitter questions. So there's a time here that we can go through, but if you have questions here, we'll, we'll go through those. And try to get to everyone. All right, so first question on the Twitter. Uh, this is from Michael Simpson, which I think is a really good question. Where do you want to be uh, from a business perspective in January 2016? Two years, basically, from today. That's hard. You know, the times that I've planned in advance and put out like a one-year plan, first of all, I'm always off by 50%. Uh, not in a good way. So if I tell you I'm going to do a certain amount of revenue in a given year, it's very good soon I'm going to do half. Um, but there are so many opportunities that have come up in the last year and a half. Like it's crazy to me that I've only been selling books and that sort of thing for a year and a half. Um, so there's so many opportunities that come up that you just can't predict. So I've actually made a habit of only planning three months out. So I may have ideas of what I want to do long term, like I'm trying to move more of my business from one-off sales to recurring revenue. Um, but as far as specific goals, numbers, that sort of thing, uh, the furthest out I have planned is the end of March. So, what are some things what are some, when you're thinking about projects and stuff? Though? So what are some things that you're, that you're thinking about for this year in terms of new things that you want to explore or launch? Uh, I've got... Well, I'm working on launching this Photoshop course right now. I, can, I have two audiences that overlap. I have the, the marketers and <coughs> authors and people who care about marketing on one side and then the designers on the other. And so I'm constantly trying to come up you know, work on content and products that match both of those. So uh, I have the Photoshop course coming out for the designers and then I'm going to do a course on product launches. Um, then I'm going to try to work on a new video training site yeah, but that, and then, you know, constantly working on keep working, trying to work that. Yeah, and along with that, so this is a, a good question. This is from, uh, I think this is from Michael as well. Uh, how do you come up with pricing for your product? So we talked about sort of tiered pricing, which works really, really well, not just for Nathan, but for, we see data across the board, from film, to books, to uh, basically every content vertical. Tiered pricing works really well. Um, but how do you come up with the actual price points? This is probably one of the top questions that I get and that we get emailed into us all the time. Yeah, so come up with a, like an event number of what you think you should price it at and then double that. And then you know put it up for sale and see how the sales are. And if they're coming in recently, double the price again. And see if you lose more than 50% of the sales. Right? If you double the price and don't lose 50% of your sales, then keep going. <laughs> just keep going. So we point out that the logical conclusion of that isn't to go, oh, double the price works. Cool. The logical conclusion is to double it again, especially if you're selling businesses. Um, anyway, that that's uh, the way. I, one one way I tend to think about it is I want people to get a lot of value out of my books. So as long as they get ten times at least 10 times the value um, of, of the price, I'm happy to do it. So in my book, Authority, I wrote a lot about multiple packages, what you should include, how to do it. And my friend Brett had done with some, you know, I had to pester him a little bit, but he implemented it on his second book. And in the first week, he made an extra $15,000. And so I'm totally confident charging $250 for some training that made him $15,000. So I kind of like that 10x rule. As long as people are getting at least 10 times the value out of it of what you're charging, then that's good. Um, but I'd be really, really careful with low prices. Uh, usually, 
you know, if you double the price, you're not going to lose half the customers. But that said, if you start at like two dollars, boy, it takes a lot of sales at two dollars or ninety-nine cents to turn into anything. Like selling iPhone apps at ninety-nine cents, boy, is that a bad business? Like, <laughs> it's just you need so many people for that to turn into anything. Whereas if you're selling a forty-dollar or a hundred-dollar product, then you don't need that many customers. So. I think higher prices are better, price based on value. Um, another area, like for anyone who's doing teaching or courses, if you're teaching a skill that makes money to people who have money, then you can charge much higher prices. So if you're teaching knitting to 12 year olds, knitting doesn't make money, 12 year olds don't have any money, that's not, you can't charge reasonable prices then. But if you're teaching design, to designers, they're thinking about, if I learn these new skills, if I get better, say I get a 5% raise based on implementing this. That's $5,000, you know, $8,000, that's a lot of money. And so, a couple hundred dollars on a course uh, is totally worth it. I guess the last area is sometimes you can have one side of the coin, not the other, where uh, I have a friend who, for a while, was teaching like career skills to college students. So career skills, that's gonna make you money. College students don't have money. And so that was a hard thing of figuring out whose customer was and figuring out the price of there. Totally. Uh, let's take a question. We have someone here, so let's go there. Hey, hey. Um, that's fine. All right. So you've reiterated, reiterated a number of times how beneficial it can be to price your product in multiple tiers. Um, but this is something that you've also reiterated. Um, Sasha and Chris published their numbers about their earnings, and so have you. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how that has affected your earnings since then. Um, has talking about how much money you've made increased the amount of money that you're making now? Um, I, I think the answer is yes, but I, I want to know what you think about that. Like, where do you draw the line in terms of talking about how well you're doing? Because obviously everyone's story is different. Find success uh, differently depending on you know the tactic you take. Right. So yeah, I've gotten into kind of an odd situation where I now make money teaching people how to make money, um, which on one hand it sounds really weird, but then when you see some of these ideas really really work, like in in Brennan's case, you just think, wow, I have to get this out to so many more people. And so, in sharing numbers, uh, in talking about how every product launch goes, I'm taking that philosophy that I learned from Chris Boyer of teaching everything that I know and just making it public. So actually, I didn't blog about marketing, or I didn't have any plans to go down that road. Um, I, mine was a design blog. I was a designer and I wrote about design. Except that after a launch came out, because of what Sasha and Jared had done with their ebook, I wrote a blog post saying, here's how the launch went, here's everything. Okay, now we can move back to talking about design. And I did that for the next book as well. And then I started to get way more questions about uh, pricing, launching products, writing books, than I was actually getting about design. And, and I enjoy talking about that. So I guess I would say, whatever you're working on, share it, teach it, and you just you won't know until it happens what opportunities are going to come because of that. So you also get some weird things like uh, I mean, being public about numbers does result in some strange social situations at like Thanksgiving dinner and that kind of thing. So one thing I will say is I've taken to like talking with family and others. Even though the numbers are public, I found it's not a good idea to mention making $12,000 in a single day. Uh, <laughs> if it comes up in conversation, it's better to say, if you want to hear how the book launch did, you can read about it on their blog. And not bring that up with family, because it can get weird. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to take another question off of Twitter. So there's a couple people that have asked this in different ways, uh, basically wanting to know, what are your thoughts on self-publishing versus traditional publishing? and why you chose, at least for the first three books, this is something we've talked a lot about, but why you chose self-publishing for the first three books and what you think the benefits are of each. Yeah, so, let's see, I didn't think I would finish a book, 
And so make a deal, you know, like right there. Rules that out. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also, I probably, I don't think I had any confidence to think that someone would, uh, would actually want to publish one of my books. So it was a low barrier to entry. Um, the other thing is I wanted to make money from my books. So everything that I've done that I've talked about here, I've maximized for revenue. And in a journey to build an audience, there's a bunch of things you can maximize for. Uh, you could maximize for the biggest reach, the most subscribers. Maybe you want to be able to add the best-selling author to your bio. Um, I was trying to maximize for revenue. And so, you know, my pricing decisions, self-publishing, all of that uh, went that way. There's, there's a bit of a reputation for traditionally published technical books. Like you go pick up um, an introduction to Objective-C book, for example. That author probably got a seven to ten thousand dollar advance, and probably will never print out that advance. And so they're making a dollar per copy, maybe less. It's not a good way to make money. Maybe then you could say you're a published author, and that will help your consulting gigs or whatever else. Um, since I want to maximize the revenue, I knew that. I wanted to get all of the sale minus the 5% and the 25 cents. So. And I feel like you sort of, you know, a lot of people want to be a published author to build their audience and sort of be able to get a lot of speaking gigs and stuff like that. And I feel like because you've been so open about your numbers, teaching on your blog, all that stuff, you've sort of been able to get the benefits of both because now you have an audience that and sort of demands to conferences and do events without having to have gone down sort of the traditional publishing path. Yep. Yeah, um, going back to the earlier question, if I had launched these books and just kept quiet about it, my audience wouldn't have grown in the same way. Uh, I wouldn't be speaking at conferences or anything like that. It's just, what I've come to realize is people don't, or just they, experts don't teach because, they, because they're experts. They're, they are perceived as experts because they teach. And so wherever you're at in the process, you need to start teaching. Even if you're learning a skill for the very first time, you can, you can start teaching that. You can say, I am learning from programming. Um, I'm two days in, but I know more than some people. And so I would say, just be honest about where you're at. Start teaching at your level. And that's what Chris Warrior did. He was not. Not an expert when he started teaching, and he hadn't written any books, but um, through teaching, he became an expert. Awesome. So we're going to do one final question, uh, or maybe two, uh, from here in the audience. Hi, Nathan. What are, uh, you've been talking a lot about how to profit from your audience, but how would you grow your audience, assuming that you're starting at zero? What are your top three tips for building or starting to build your audience? Okay, let's see if I can come up with three. Um, the first one I would say is be useful to one person. So, my book, Designing My Applications, is written to my brother in law, Philip. In fact, there are times where, when I would get stuck, where I would write, you know, I'm writing a tutorial and I would write Philip, comma, enter, enter, and then I would write it as though I was teaching him that exact skill. Because he was about a year into the becoming a designer, he had a job at a software company, and so I was just, I was teaching him exactly what um, what I thought designers should learn. And that helped me make sure that what I was writing was useful, at least to one person. And if it's useful to one person, it's going to be useful to a lot of people. And it also helped to not write in either a really, really stuffy way or a super casual way. You just wrote as if you're teaching. And Sometimes it's easy to have your writing come across as pretentious or, anyway. Sometimes it's easy to get weird in your writing. And so if you're thinking about one specific person and teaching them, that, that helps. Um, I had other thoughts that followed that, <laughs> but yeah, that's great. Anyway. Right, so, so one person. Yeah. yeah. All right, we have time for maybe one, maybe two more, depending on how long we are. Hi, um, I would love to know, like, have you ever used Outdoor for doing email marketing? Sorry, you used what? Outdoor. 
So the question is, uh, have you ever used AWeber for doing email AWeber. marketing, I think? Yeah. Um, I have an account with AWeber. I pay them $19 a month. And the only reason is because I wanted to see how they did their UI on that particular thing. Uh, and I just haven't canceled the account yet. So for context, AWeber is like an email marketing platform similar to MailChimp that allows you to build email lists, send out email newsletters, etc. Yeah. So, so I ha I've used AWeber a tiny bit and then I've clicked through it. But um, I don't use it actively. Um, I right now I use a combination of ConvertKit, which is tool I built, and Mailchimp. Um, and I'm gradually switching out from Mailchimp, but they have things I don't like. But overall, it's a really solid product. Yeah, we highly recommend Mailchimp. It's really, really awesome. All right, let's do one more question. If you have questions, line up so you can get uh, at the mic, depending on how much time we have. Um, hi, I'm Lauren Harriman. I'm here for. Justice Clinic at the University of San Francisco. Um, so you've said a lot about finding uh, opportunities to teach, and that kind of made you an expert in the field. Where did you find these places to teach? So I just started writing it on my blog, and then trying to share it with anyone who would listen. And because it was, I was trying to make what I was writing useful to someone. Then. I met my goal, I would publish a blog post, and it was useful to Philip or to whoever else I wrote it to. And so in that sense, the post was already a success. Um, but then I'd go promote it around the, uh, around the web. Uh, there'd be groups like, or newsletters like iOS Dev Weekly, or Hacker News, or places like that. I'd submit links, I'd participate in subreddits. Um, Participate on Stack Overflow, you know, just wherever my audience hung out online. Don't spam them, but if you, like on Stack Overflow, if you go answer some question in detail and then say, if you want to learn more about that, I also wrote a full blog post, then, and it's relevant and useful, then you're going to start to build and attract an audience. Thank you. Awesome. Do we have one more? Or is that very cool? So let's give it up for David. Thank you so much for and I also want to thank a couple people uh, who spent a lot of time and energy making this awesome. So first of all, uh, a huge thank you to Parasoma and specifically Melanie. Melanie, where are you? Yeah. 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 So we're going to have awesome. Uh, we're hosting this event and a couple more events here. Uh, hopefully a lot more. So um, highly recommend them as a co-working space during the day and they host awesome events. Um, at night. And then also want to uh, thank Chef Louis Estrada, who is here doing an awesome food. <laughs> and there will be more food, I think, afterwards. Uh, yeah, so there's food out there with some desserts and stuff. Uh, and then also a huge thanks to two people from the Gumbro team. Jessica, who's going to be really mad at you for doing this. Please go wait or something. There we go. And Chicago's are right here on the camera. So that's how it Designed all these awesome GoPro uh, posters that have different cool products on them. So thank you guys so much for all your hard work. Um, and then we have 845A doing headshots here in the back. So they're going to keep doing headshots afterwards. So if you want to catch all headshots done, head over there. They're great for Twitter, Facebook, email newsletters, whatever. Um, and then also, what? Sorry. And they're free. And they're free. You pay a lot of money to get these done. Otherwise. That's what we're paying for it. So definitely go over there and take advantage of that. And then finally, once again, thank you so much, Nathan, for hanging out. It's been a blast. So we have two more events on this slide. Uh, so we have uh, an event with Primo, who's the founder of Funchineer and Busy Bee. She's one of the founding engineers of Mint as well. And we're going to be doing an event with her on March 13th uh, at Gilmer Beach Q. And then we're also going to have uh, another event in. Back here at Parasoma on April 17th, and we're going to announce more details uh, of that. We're going to publish all this content, the slides, everything uh, on the web, so be on the lookout there. And we're going to run out of some t shirt sizes, so if you didn't get a t shirt, we're going to send out a blast to you, and you'll get a form to go fill out your stuff, and we'll send you a t shirt. Um, so we're going to hang out for a while. Nathan will be here, I'll be here, so if you guys want to chat, uh, come find us and bring some food. And yeah, just hang out. Thanks. Thank you guys so much.